As the slide says, kids can uh, head out to the lobby and connect with teachers out there and go to their own lesson. Good morning, Grace. You know, uh, it could be that in a three month, in three months or so, you won't be saying good morning, Steve. You'll be saying good morning, John. That could very well be. Uh, we'll talk more about the pastoral candidate at the close of the service. But um, I'd like for us now to invite God to be a part of this communication. And that it wouldn't just be between me and you, but it would be between God and you. So if you know those people, if you came with those people next to you, um, might be a bit awkward for some of you, but let's push the envelope a little bit. Just grab their hand or put your arm around their shoulder because we're gonna be praying for each other now, okay? So if you'd bow your heads in prayer and, and pray for the people by name next to you, that God would have access to their heart and mind. Pray for them by name, silently, privately. Pray that those people around you, that they would hear what God wants to say to them about rest. Pray that they would hear from this speaker, from me, what God wants them to hear and that God would block out from their hearing something that should not have been said or should not have been heard. So would you pray for communication between me and those people around you? God, thanks for music that gives us a chance to talk to you. And now, in the remainder of this service, I pray that you would have access to our hearts and minds, that you would talk to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, the, the subject is Sabbathing. It's in the context of Margin, this series that we're wrapping up today. Sabbath, the Sabbath, was God's idea. He modeled it, and it goes back to the beginning of time. And today, we are kind of finishing what we started last week. It really should be one sermon, but there was too much material to cover on one Sunday, so I split it up. And if you're saying, well, I missed something. He's not covering. Yeah, that's probably because we did it last Sunday, and you can go back. You can go online, and uh, you can listen to what was said then, but God set the pattern for rest, not because he needed a breather after he had created the world and everything in it. He wasn't winded, but he gave us a timeless universal principle to take a 24-hour long break from work every six days. Work six, don't work one. Work six, don't work one. The big idea from last week was Sabbathing is a timeless cadence that was modeled for us by our tireless creator 
for his glory and for our good. And if I don't Sabbath, I'm basically telling God that I'm smarter than he is. And I'm the fool. Last Sunday, we developed a systematic theology for Sabbathing from the scriptures. Even before that, we talked about margin in the context of redeeming the time or making the most of every opportunity. You might remember that I used the illustration of our lives are kind of like a barrel, and we've got basketballs and baseballs and ping pong balls inside that barrel that uh, represents our obligations, our commitments. And every once in a while, we need to dump out the barrel and we need to say, God, does this basketball belong in my barrel any longer? Or should this basketball be baseball sized or ping pong ball sized? And, and to continue asking each basketball, does this belong in here? And then sometimes reminding ourselves that when there's a, a life transition, like a baby suddenly comes into our household, well, that's a basketball that has to go in the barrel. And uh, there's no leaving that up to somebody else. And then we talked about Mary and Martha and we contrasted the fact that Mary had margin and she was willing to sit down and listen to Jesus, but Martha, she was just busy running around doing everything that needed to be done. And then Jesus said, no, not everything that you're doing needs to be done. One thing would have been sufficient. My take on that is, that's, he's talking about a casserole. <laughs> Along with those lessons, Last Sunday, we identified Sabbathing as a margin mandate. We live in a culture that does not promote rest. But ironically, it hypes the weekend. And then we've got legislate, legislators who are now saying, uh, let's reduce the work week from five days to four days. We live in a culture that doesn't know how to rest. And last Sunday, we kind of reminded everybody to go home and take a nap. And, and naps are good for you, unless you take them while driving the car. That's not good. But the questions come up like, when's a new mom's Sabbath? <laughs> when's a country doctor's Sabbath? When's a store manager's Sabbath? When's a dairy farmer's Sabbath? Sabbath? When's a pastor's Sabbath? When's an international spy's Sabbath? I bet you never asked that one before. <laughs> and I really don't have good, clear answers. Although some neo-Pharisees who live in our day and age do, they might say, well, sure, it's clear, it's this or it's that, and I don't agree. It's it's not something that we can be certain about, and I'm not sure that it's really that important. Because practically speaking, Sundays are usually the best day for most people to Sabbath in the United States. The American society, as a general rule, used to live by laws in print and in practice that were against working on Sundays. And I don't think you, help me out, but I don't think you can shop for a car in Minnesota on Sundays, can you? I, I don't think you can. So there are still some laws on the books that kind of tell us to Sabbath on Sunday. Strict legalistic adherences to Sunday Sabbathing began in America, from what I can tell, in the 1500s, the 1600s, with the Puritans. And sometimes we might want to question their intentions. They may not have had the right whys, but they had the right whats. What should good people do or not do on Sundays weren't bad, but their, their motivations, their intentions, their whys weren't always the best. But I would suggest to you that it was a whole lot easier to keep a Sabbath when all our neighbors and friends Sabbathed on the same day. But 24-7 conveniences that we demand now in our modern society have basically, they've, they've just degraded on Sunday Sabbathing. And so blue laws which some are still on the books, blue laws to not work or not open establishments or, or not shop even on Sundays, those have basically been 
obliterated and our profit-driven, service-oriented economy makes social Sabbathing difficult, if not impossible. It was a whole lot easier for me growing up on a farm in an agricultural economy where all my neighbors, all my friends, everybody at church, they all stopped working on Sundays. And, and when we think about the industrial age that we've come out of now, uh, you know, it was pretty much the union-driven 40-hour work week and most people Sabbathed on, on Sunday. It's difficult now. We should probably all go to Perkins after this service because we can't go to Chick-fil-A and, and complain about the disappearance of blue laws. Or we should go to Chick-fil-A on Monday and say thank you for helping us have a Sabbath on Sunday and reminding us that people should stop working one day a week. Of course, when we talk about Sabbathing, we have a, a question that's being begged, I think, in some of your minds, and that is, God set it up to work six and then not work the seventh, and he instructed the Jews to work six and not work on the seventh, so how come our Sabbathing isn't on Saturdays? Shouldn't it be on Saturdays instead of, so how did we ever get to Sunday Sabbathing anyway? I think these answers might help with that question. Jesus Christ was resurrected and he made post-resurrection appearances on Sunday. And the Christians met regularly on Sunday. They had Sunday night church because they worked during the day and then they came and they gathered together to listen to the apostles' teaching typically on Sunday nights. We know that because a guy died during one of those Sunday night services. In the book of Acts, I think it's Acts chapter 20, we, we find that this guy, he'd probably been working all day, so he was physically tired, exhausted. He came to church, and he sat in a window, an open window, and he was breathing in some oxygen-depleted air from the oil lamps around him, maybe. You can't tell me I'm not right. <laughs> And he fell asleep during the sermon, and he fell out the window, and he died. So the rule, the principle from that is, no more Sunday night church. <laughs> uh, some of you grew up like I did. Yeah, we had Sunday night church. But they met on Sundays. And, and then also, let's remember that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and he said, collect offerings on Sunday. So the Sabbathing, morphed from Saturday to Sunday, and you might say, well, that's obvious because that's the Lord's day. Well, as I briefly mentioned last week, that's not proof of anything, calling a day the Lord's day. That comes from Revelation chapter, I think it's the first chapter, isn't it? Revelation chapter one, the Lord's day is better translated, the day of the Lord, and in apocalyptic literature, the day of the Lord is an era. It's not a 24-hour period. So to call Sunday the Lord's day is pretty hard to uh, support from Scripture, just like it would be hard to call Sabbath, or Saturday, the Lord's day. Uh, that's just a quick aside there. Romans 5, 14, 5 says this, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. So I suggest to you that which day we Sabbath is really not that significant. And if you can't Sabbath on Sunday like most people, then set aside another day in the seven. And how we Sabbath is not really consistent among the saints either because of the different jobs that we have the other six days. So what's considered work to you might be considered non-work to me, and vice versa. So picking up a hammer is different for a carpenter than it is for his contractor. For the contractor, Picking up a hammer might be a hobby. It might be a restful activity for him, but not for a carpenter, right? A landscaper, for a landscaper, mowing the lawn is work, but for, well, let's just get real personal. For me, mowing the lawn is relaxing. 
Not your lawn, by the way. I'm just mowing my, just mowing my lawn. So should we make a big deal of it? I don't think so. Let's just, let's be wise. Let's not be foolish. And let's practice the pattern that God set before us. So now, after last Sunday, we spent lots of time in scriptures. Today, we're not going to spend as much time. I'm going to get pragmatic and practical, and I'm going to be a Sabbath coach, and I'm going to tell you things from my observations, my, my reading, my experience. Because now, it's ironic, but we have to work at resting. Don't we? In our rush, rush, mad dash society, we have to work at resting. Well, here's, here's three, three conclusions I'm gonna make today. The first one is I can find my Sabbath rest when I cherish solitude and silence. Sabbathing won't happen while we're on the run. Solitude and silence are biblical. We could go to Habakkuk 2.20. We could go to Zephaniah 1.7, Zechariah 2.13, David and Isaiah, the, the major prophet. And we could see that silent be, silence before God was important. Then we look at Jesus, and we see that Jesus modeled silence and solitude. He went out to the wilderness. He went up to the mountain. He went to a desolate place, the scriptures tell us. Matthew 4.1, Matthew 14.23, Mark 1.35, Luke 4.42. And when you think about how simple and uncomplicated Jesus' life was compared to ours and all the distractions we have, and still, even though Jesus lived a simple life, he still felt it was necessary to get alone with God, to be silent, to be in a place of solitude. Solitude and silence were easier before the invention of the light bulb and before email. And now there are new Sabbath threats in this millennium because the iPhone isn't even two decades old. But we are attached to it at the hip, <laughs> literally. Many of us are tethered to work 24 7 by our smartphones. I realize that as I've been working on these sermons on Sabbathing and on resting, I can't even watch Wheel of Fortune anymore without having my tablet open so I can check my news feed during the chit chat between what's his name and the contestants and the commercials. I can't even sit down and just relax and watch a game show and let the, let the commercials wash over, I, I've got to switch to my, my data, my news feed on my tablet. <laughs> our ability to be present, our ability to be mindful has decayed. The first time I made a missions trip to Africa, to the Ivory Coast, our stopover was in Paris, and we had, I don't know, a day and a half to kind of see the sights. And I was looking forward to being able to run around. We had, we had these ticket passes on the, on the mass transit, anything about what we want. And then after, after they took our orders, it took maybe a half hour to get the food. And then for them to come back and, and check on us, there was long periods of time. I, I had things to do. I wanted to get out. I wanted to see the sights. I wanted to get on the train. I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to get around. And my friend said, hold it, we're in Paris. In Paris, French people, they know how to enjoy their food. They know how to relax and chat and converse and relish. There's no fast food in Paris. I need that solitude and that silence that Jesus needed, that God modeled. So in Kierkegaard, no matter what you might think about some of his theology, he said almost 200 years ago, if I could only prescribe one remedy for the ills of the modern world, 
I would prescribe silence. For if the word of God were proclaimed, it would not be heard right now. There's too much noise. And he wrote this at the end of his life, in the middle of the 19th century. So I prescribe silence. You see, Sabbathing is a day for rebooting and resetting and being renewed. It's a spiritual staycation. Sabbathing realigns us with the Creator and with His creation and with creatures, fellow creatures around us. Setting time aside for God and entering into God's rest and listening for God's voice. It's important. We're supposed to find this margin once every seven days. Okay, back to our list. I can find my Sabbath rest when I cherish solitude and silence, when I discover purpose, value, and meaning in more than just my work. And I've got... Okay, it's, it's, it's a disclaimer here. Work is good. We talked about that last week. God said, work six days, don't work one day. Work is good. It's, and the Bible gives us a lot, of, a lot of lessons about work. Check the book of Proverbs. Uh, look it up in a topical Bible, and, and you'll, you'll be taken to some of the letters that Paul wrote to, to local churches about work. And we, most of us, maybe all of us, have grown up with this Protestant work ethic but it, the Protestant work ethic can be outside of God's will because overload and burnout are bad. And Sabbathing can be just what the doctor ordered, literally. We humans, we require spurs and reins. We require somebody to say, giddy up, and we require somebody to say, whoa. We require gas pedals and brake pedals. Life needs to be that way, this, this rhythm, this cadence, back and forth. I can find my Sabbath rest when I discover purpose and value and meaning in more than just my work. You see, ignoring Sabbaths can reveal a spiritual problem as it relates to my job or my work. Let me go on. If my self-worth is primarily defined by my job, or my ministry. I'm talking to all of us here, including me. If my self-worth is primarily defined by my job or ministry, I'll only Sabbath grudgingly, if at all. If my self-image is tied to my job, especially if I've been successful, my Sabbaths won't happen. And so I need to ask myself, why do I not Sabbath? Is it to prove that I'm in charge? Is it to give the impression that I'm indispensable? Is it to publicize my carefully curated reputation for being a hard worker? Is it to show others that I'm kind of a big deal? Theologian Philip Melanchthon was a contemporary of Martin Luther, and they enjoyed having, as you can imagine, they enjoyed having a lot of robust theological discussions. One day, Philip Melanchthon came to his friend Martin Luther and said, today, let's discuss the governance of the universe. And Martin Luther said, no, today, Let's go fishing and let God take care of the governance of the universe. <laughs> there are two hobbies that we Minnesotans can get away with without being declared lazy or without being ridiculed as being slackers. Those two hobbies are hunting and fishing. We can sit in a tree stand for half a day being as silent as a mouse and nobody thinks we're lazy. Or we can sit in a boat and cast a line out into the lake over and over and, and do hardly anything else for a whole day and nobody would call us lazy. Uh, 
Maybe Sabbaths are for fishing. Maybe Sabbaths are for hunting. With God's help, I may have to reorient my mind to not working and to instead go fishing, to not being at work, to not always be managing my workplace even when I'm not at the workplace. And if I haven't probed enough, be careful, because here comes another one. I won't find Sabbath rest until God and I get a handle on my psychological, physiological, and emotional addiction to adrenaline and to busyness and to noise and to activity. I might be idolizing the Martha me. We've got to get a handle on our work. Sabbath skipping may not be a sin, as we learned last week, but it often exposes an addiction to busyness, or it can reveal a latent Messiah complex where I believe I'm totally needed here, there, and everywhere. And if I don't Sabbath because I think I'm the guy, I may not be breaking what I consider the obsolete fourth commandment, but I am breaking the first commandment, which is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. If I think I'm the guy, and so I don't take a Sabbath, I'm breaking the first commandment. I don't always have to be on call. I'm not indispensable. Little neighbor nudge here. That's, for those of you who haven't heard me preach before, that's where you gently, gently nudge your neighbor and whisper to them. In Psalm 23, there's a verse that says, he makes me, now finish the rest of it to your neighbor, he makes me, he makes me lie down in green pastures. John Mark Comer is a, uh, a younger pastor. Of course, they're all young to me. But he's a, he's a pastor who's been in Portland, Oregon for a couple of decades, I think, and now I think he's in uh, the LA area. John Mark Comer has written a lot of good stuff, and uh, he's kind of brought us back to the contemplative life, spiritually speaking. In his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, I'm going to pick up on page 174 where he talks about the Sabbath for him and his family. To begin, just set aside a day. Clear your schedule, turn off your phone, say a prayer to invite the Holy Spirit to pastor you, that's good, to shepherd you into his presence, and then rest and worship in whatever way is life-giving for your soul. My family and I do this every week. Just before sunset on Friday, we finish up all our to-do lists and homework and grocery shopping and responsibilities, and we power down all our devices, and we literally put them all in a box and stow it in the closet. And then we gather around the table as a family, and we open a bottle of non-Baptist beverage. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> we light some candles, we read a psalm, we pray, then we feast, and we basically don't stop feasting for the next 24 hours. There might be a sin there, but uh, <laughs> it's the Comer way, and I might add, the Jesus way. We sleep in Saturday morning, drink coffee, read our Bibles, pray more, spend time together, talk, laugh. In, in summer, we walk to the park. In the winter, we make a fire. We get lost in good novels on the couch. We cuddle, we nap. The Jews even have a name for the Sabbath nap. It's the Shabbat Shluf. We schluff hard on our Sabbath. <laughs> Honestly, I spend a lot of time just sitting by the window, being. It's like a less stressful Christmas every week. And something happens about halfway through the day, something hard to put language to. It's like my soul catches up to my body like some deep part of me that got beat down and drowned out by meetings and email and Twitter and relational conflict and the difficulty of life comes back to the surface 
of my heart. I feel free. Free from the need to do more, get more, be more. Free from the spirit, the evil demonic spirit of restlessness that enslaves our society. I feel another spirit, the Holy Spirit, of restful calm settle over my whole person and I find that my ordinary life is enough. And on Saturday evening when I turn my phone back on and I re-enter the modern world, I do so slowly and wow, does it ever feel good. Let's pick up our list again. I can find, our, I can find my Sabbath rest when I cherish solitude and silence when I discover purpose, value, and meaning in more than just my work, and then I believe most importantly, when I don't forget that eternal rest is possible because of Jesus' work on the cross. Now I want you to know, Sabbathing is good for, for my mind and my body as well as my soul. In 1 Timothy 4, 8, Paul writes, physical training is good. I could just stop there and I could paraphrase it, physical sabbathing is good. In some of my uh, commercial breaks, reading news feeds, I, I've noticed the last couple of weeks there, there have been articles, there have been studies done on how important it is to be people of faith because people of faith are more likely than other people to take a day off of work and they are more likely than other people not to engage in bad habits and they're more likely than others to socialize with one another and these are all good for us physically and emotionally and psychologically. But training for godliness is much better, promising, as Paul writes, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. We could, we could list practical ways to Sabbath. We could, we could list practical benefits of, of a weekly rest. But there's a spiritual rest component that matters more. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Remember last week we learned that the original Sabbath commandment was given to the Israelites as a way to remind them that they had been delivered out of slavery, out of slavery from Egypt. And it was also meant to be a reminder that they had this covenant with God Almighty. In the same way, we can Sabbath and we can remember our deliverance from sin and we can re remember the new covenant that we have with God through Jesus Christ, his shed blood, his broken body, which we remember every communion service, this new covenant that we have. The Sabbath is a day to commemorate everything that Jesus paid for when he paid it all on the cross. And so we can rest in what Christ did for us at Calvary. We no longer have to work in order to be justified in the sight of God. The author of Hebrews in the 10th chapter the 12th verse writes this, but our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for our sins, good for all time. And then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. After making the ultimate sacrifice, what did Jesus do? He sat down and rested. He ceased from his labor of providing for our atonement because there was no more work that ever had to be done, ever. And I can rest when I gaze in awe and wonder at the cross that provides an eternal rest. Okay, I'm going to take a frontage road here for a just a brief time, and, and I'm gonna suggest that the weight and the gravitas of that reality is, is really hard to absorb if we're only sitting at home in front of a computer screen 
that's sitting on the coffee table, drinking coffee from our favorite mug and still dressed in our sweats. And we call that church. It has a place, but I think the kinds of things that happen in this room week after week can't be duplicated by someone alone at home. Okay, back to the main road. We can Sabbath when we embrace true rest in what God has done for us, which is more likely when we are in church. So today's big idea is to Sabbath is to break free from the ball and chain of relentless physical work and useless spiritual efforts. To Sabbath is to break free from the ball and chain of relentless physical work and useless spiritual efforts. Keeping the Sabbath is not a pair of handcuffs. It's a liberator. Sabbathing is the key that unlocks the cuffs of life in 2024. I'm going to speak a benediction on you. Your eyes don't have to close. Bless these workers. Bless these employers. Bless these students. Bless these homemakers. Bless these volunteers. Lord, when we're on the job, make us fully present workers. Let us promote the flourishing of our workplace at our company, at our school, at our home. Lord, when we're not on the job, help us to rest fully. Replace our fretting with your peace. Replace our running around with our sitting down to be with you. Replace our believing that everything depends on us with our believing that everything depends on you. Today, this day, help us set aside time and attention to Sabbath and to rest in you. Amen. Amen. Okay, we've got an uh, introduction video from John and his wife Erica that we want you to watch right now. Thank <laughs> you. 